partner of member states of Africa Union, Africa Union Commission, the regional economic communities, and of course, we uh, gave um, the, the, the CESA, the Continental Education Strategy uh, for the continent 2016-2015. Uh, um, uh, 20, so UNESCO was part and parcel really to help the African Union and all the entities in the consultation, the assessment of the previous decade, of course, and the development of the framework of the, 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 the strategy. And of course, for the continental uh, um, education strategy, it coincides actually with the adoption of the 2015 agenda, the 2030 agenda, which was ad adopted in 2015 uh, with the roadmap, the 2030 uh, sustainable development agenda. So just to remind that uh, we are really part and parcel of that agenda and UNESCO, uh, uh, along with other UN agencies such as uh, uh, UNICEF, uh, ILO uh, um, uh, are supporting this, uh, this process. And just to come back on the 2006 uh, uh, the Africa Union Summit in, uh, in Khartoum, it's a, it's a critical summit since it was the one which actually adopted all the frameworks also in culture, including the Charter for African Cultural Renaissance, which is a key framework actually that we are celebrating also this, uh, uh, on this Africa Day in, in uh, 2021. Uh, the charter um, was entered into force uh, last year. Uh, so it took a lot of time to, to, to enter into force. And there are still a lot of countries that have still not ratified it. And it's an important, uh, um, uh, charter and framework which uphold that the unity of the continent is founded first and foremost on its history. And uh, the charter further stresses the need for the reconstruction of the historical memory and conscience of Africa and the African diaspora. So this, uh, this charter is really critical, but it still needs really to be ratified by all the 55 African uh, member states. And it needs to be, of course, implemented in its different uh, areas, be it in issues of languages, issues of heritage, issues of uh, uh, creative and cultural and Recognition of culture has a key lever for uh, development, has a key lever for the Africa we want. So I wanted to, uh, to, to, to remind this, to put it in perspective, this historical summit of 2006 in Khartoum and the adoption of this key uh, political framework at the continental level, be it in education and, uh, and in, uh, in culture. And just to remind it, the work and the contribution of UNESCO in this regard with the Africa Union Commission, with the um, uh, devoted uh, commissions, uh, departments uh, in charge of education, science, human resource science and technology, and the one uh, in charge of uh, social affairs, which deals with culture uh, issues. So uh, really UNESCO is a, uh, is a, is a strong, a partner of this uh, of this uh, framework and, uh, and 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 Africa Union and personally I was very um, I'm I'm very committed and passionate about since I was involved also in all of this conversation uh, before the Khartoum summit and then in the implementation since I was in charge of the cooperation with AU Commission and the Regional Economic Commission from. Uh, uh, the Africa Department at, uh, at, at headquarters. So uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I wanted to remind these, uh, the importance of this cooperation with UNESCO. UNESCO really ensured that uh, its uh, blueprint, its strategy takes into account and is aligned with the African uh, blueprints, be it in education, in sciences with STISA, um, uh, 24 and uh, with cultures, with the different framework and culture, such as the charter of uh, 
uh, the African uh, cultural uh, renaissance. And uh, as we are celebrating 2021, the year of uh, arts, uh, culture, and heritage, they are, the African Union uh, Commission has developed uh, a comprehensive uh, program uh, for the world year uh, addressing several issues uh, on the agenda of uh, culture. Uh, I wish to uh, cite, to mention some of them. The first one actually is the promotion of the charter, the ratification of the charter to ensure that all member states are ratifying it. Uh, one uh, major activity is the agenda in, uh, in, the, in cinema uh, with the establishment of the Secretary of the African uh, and uh, Audiovisual Commission uh, and acceleration of the process of ratification of the statutes of the AACC. Uh, one of the key uh, activity in this year is uh, the one uh, of the Great African Museum. You know, one of uh, the, 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 the project of the Af uh, Great African Museum, which is hosted by Algeria, is one of the flagship uh, program of AU in culture. There's another flagship uh, program is the Grand Egyptian Museum uh, in, uh, in, in, in Cairo. Uh, another uh, key uh, intervention this year is the uh, Africa uh, Music Awards. This one is, uh, is led by, uh, by DRC this year, DRC, uh, which is uh, chairing currently the African Union Commission. One milestone intervention this year is the organization of the second Pan-African Writer Conference. Uh, we don't have the right date. It is uh, planned for August, but uh, still to be confirmed. And uh, we hope that uh, Pan-African uh, African Writer Association, which is based in uh, Accra also, will play an active role in it. Another key intervention this year is the African Union policy on arts education. Uh, another one is the AU plan of action on cultural industries um, uh, organization and the organization of the sixth Pan-African Cultural uh, Congress. Um, another key intervention this year is the, well, the promotion of culture of peace in Africa, the publication of the periodic scientific journal on oral history and tradition, including public health issues, uh, the flagship project of Encyclopedia Africa project, uh, and uh, lastly, the promotion of the general history of Africa. Uh, just to come back on this important uh, project, uh, uh, where the general history of Africa, as you all remember, this is a flagship intervention of uh, UNESCO. Actually, in the 1964, uh, UNESCO launched this uh, monumental project at the, uh, at the request of African member states uh, in support of the new, uh, new newly independent African countries' um, uh, willingness to take uh, back ownership over the narration of uh, highlight of their history and uh, reaffirmation of their cultural identities. So uh, these uh, on the face, one of the project, which uh, concluded in 1999, uh, there were eight volumes which were released of the general history of Africa, uh, a product of a pioneering scientific and intellectual endeavor that has mobilized more than 230 historians over 35 years, and that covered the history of the entire African continent from the appearance of mankind to the contemporary challenges uh, facing African and their diaspora in the world. But despite this great achievement, several studies and surveys undertaken by UNESCO showed that the volumes of the general history of Africa remain inaccessible to the public at large, and that it was neither widely disseminated nor sufficiently used in schools and universities. So that's how in 2009, a phase two 
a phase uh, phase two of the project uh, started uh, was activated uh, was activated with the objective really to develop pedagogical uh, materials for both formal and non-formal education as well as the elaboration of additional volumes of the collection so we are currently in the second phase of this uh, project and Af actually africa union uh, member states requested unesco for technical assistance to develop common educational contents including textbooks teacher guides and accompanying material based on the general history of africa so this is a really a critical domain in which really we are inviting also the association of african university to join this journey and this project to see really how we can ensure that the general history of africa is really embedded in the program the education and cultural program in each of the 55th countries in Africa. And uh, we cannot celebrate Africa Union arts heritage, uh, arts culture heritage without uh, starting, uh, I would say, with the Sankofa symbol that we learned here in Ghana, knowing where we come from, knowing about of our history. So the knowledge is there, the history is there. It needs to be vulgarized, shared, and put into the content. So uh, I will stop in this invitation, really, to all the association, all intellectuals, really, to, uh, to devote, to spend energy in this, uh, uh, in this invitation, really, to share about our history, to ensure that it is uh, in, in, in our program. And of course, UNESCO will be your partners on the collective uh, platform, AUC, Regional Economic Commissions, but of course at the member states levels and with all the different organizations. And I'm sure Association of African University will play and is playing actually a critical role in this regard. So, uh, sorry, I may have been a little bit long, uh, yes. but I have to say about this journey and this conversation. And thank you again, I will be here to follow and to respond if needed of some of the questions. Thank you. Medas. Yes. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Diallo. Yes, if we were on a face-to-face -face event, then we would do champions for you. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you. And well done. Yes, um, ladies and gentlemen, right now I've uh, enabled the chat uh, panel. Um, but um, from what he has said, I think, uh, we can all agree that, ladies and gentlemen, it's no longer uh, the arts, culture, and the heritage which we normally you knew about. This time around, all that has happened in the past, all that has been done in arts and culture needs to be brought to the fore in order even for it to be part of the curricula today. That is the reason why we are talking of the need for our ICTs to be part of even the curricula and part of bringing all this uh, to the fore. The SDGs, we don't need to forget about them. Entrepreneurship, how are uh, people uh, living and can get uh, uh, some economic benefit from the arts, culture, and heritage. I think we all agree that uh, digitalization of our music, our arts, our culture has been part of what has been uh, uh, used these days uh, to make money and good money because people are looking to check on their past and continue to bring uh, to the fore. Uh, allow me to uh, take us to the next level where we are starting with the sub theme on the heritage and economic cooperation. Uh, and it resonates well with what I've just uh, said right now. So, um, uh, Ms. Pamela Boama, who is uh, with the, the Association of African Universities Workshops Unit, and I work with her, is here to introduce uh, our first speaker. Thank you. 
Thank you, Dr. Maku. So like Dr. Makuku mentioned, our first speaker is Dr. Kornada Ekuamwa from Ghana. He's a cultural anthropologist with a PhD in African Studies, MPhil in Archaeology and a Bachelor of Arts in Geography and Resource Development. He's a lecturer with the multidisciplinary studies of the whole technique studies of the Ho Technical University, Ghana. His research interests are on African cultures and development, African indigenous, indigenous knowledge and Africa environmental issues. He will speak on the theme heritage and economic cooperation. Dr. Kuama, your audience. Hello, Dr. Kuama, you can please have the floor. Yes, um, maybe while this is uh, preparing, we also want to hear if got any challenges. You can unmute yourself, Doc. Can you locate him, Pamela? Yes. Did you give him I the post? He went off. Okay. So what we will do is um, we can pick on the next speaker, Dr. Bright Lumomensa, Intergovernmental Cooperation. Okay, so Dr. Bright Lumo is next with the sub team Intergovernmental Cooperation and he's an African Studies lecturer at the whole Technical University in Ghana. His main areas of expertise include African politics and security, international relations and diplomacy, and Africa in the global context. You can have the floor, Dr. Barry. Hello, uh, Dr. Mensa. are you found? You can unmute yourself. I made him a call with, but I can't find him. I'm still looking for him. Okay, I will Is he on? I just made him a call, but I, I think okay. he Maybe it's the internet. We will not stop. We can come back to them. Okay. Uh, we can uh, move on to um, Dr. Angela. Okay. So we will now have Dr. Angela Chukube Eko in Weke to speak on the subtheme curricular reform. She is from Enugu State of Southeast Nigeria and a senior lecturer in the Department of Educational Management, Business Education Program, College of Education, Michael Opara University of Agriculture, Umudike, Abia State, Southeast Nigeria. Her area of specialization is business education. Dr. Angela, you are welcome in your audience. Yes, this uh, session is the one for curricular reforms. And I know uh, most uh, uh, students and lecturers and educationists are really concerned and interested in getting this one. So we will cover curricular reforms, all the speakers. We'll come back to heritage and economic cooperation as well as intergovernmental cooperation. I thank you. Go on, Dr. Good afternoon. Anthony. Okay, good afternoon. good afternoon, Dr. Makuku. I'm glad to be here this afternoon. Happy celebration, African Union. 
I'm happy to be an African. My topic is on the curriculum reforms in Nigeria education system, a tool to preserve and uphold our arts, values, culture, and heritage. My name has been said, Dr. Angela Chekube Ekonweke is my name. And I am speaking from Nigeria. First of all, what is curriculum? Curriculum is defined as a formal and informal content and process by which learners gain knowledge and understanding, develop skills and alter attitudes, appreciation and values under the auspices of that school. It includes all the learners' experience in or outside school that are included in a program which has been devised to help him develop mentally, emotionally, socially, spiritually, and morally. In education, a curriculum is broadly defined as the totality of student experiences that occur in the educational process. The term often refers specifically to a planned sequence of instruction or to a view of the student's experiences in terms of educators or schools goals. What is curriculum reform? Curriculum reform is a process of making changes. So the curriculum with the intent of making learning and teaching more meaningful and effective. Why curriculum reform? The reform came as a result of limitations in the existing curriculum. The existing curriculum seems to be inadequate. What makes it inadequate? The existing curriculum does not appear to address unemployment, insecurity, and youth restiveness. The existing curriculum seems to neglect some ingredients of our art, culture, values, and heritage. The question is, is there anything in our culture or heritage that we can translate into our curriculum to curb unemployment and insecurity? The answer is yes. But we must first highlight on what our arts, values, and heritage are. Meaning of arts, values, heritage, and culture. Art is simply the expression of application of human creative skill and imagination, typically in a visual form, such as painting or sculpture, producing works to be appreciated primarily for their beauty or emotional power. Values are basic and fundamental beliefs that guide or motivate attitudes or action. Culture can be defined as all the behaviors, ways of life, acts, beliefs, and institutions of a population that are passed down from generation to generation. Culture has been called the way, culture has been called the way of life, acts, beliefs, and institutions of a population that are passed down from generation to generation. Culture has been called the way of life for an entire society. Heritage. Heritage is simply our inheritance, what the past has considered to us, what we value in the present, and what we chose to preserve for future generations. What are, or what we have in our heritage and culture that can reflect in the curriculum? In our heritage and culture, we see peace-loving people, harmony, security. For example, in our culture, people answer names, like such as Udoka in Ibu land, meaning peace is better. Another name, Udojiako, meaning peace holds wealth, which is the philosophy of peace and security. This <laughs> peace, harmony, and security can be taught in our schools through history, Hello, Doc. Angela, I think your network um, is got some challenge. The peaceful Africa at large. Uh, 
at large, purpose of curriculum reform. They address, to address problems in the society, the society's problem, unemployment, insecurity, youth restiveness, etc. To serve the people's economic development, scientific and technological development, political development, social development. These are the purpose and what curriculum ought to serve in our society. When we come to scientific and technological development, we have some elements of our culture and heritage that we can harness or kind of improve on the science and technology. Like we have in Nigeria, in some other tribes, we have three ethnic, major ethnic groups. We have Igbos, we have Yorubas, we have the Hausas. Then in those areas, they have so many heritage and cultures. Like in Igbo land, in Oka, we have what we call Oka blacksmith and Abliba blacksmith. These group of people or towns fabricate farm and war implements. That heritage can be translated in our curriculum to be oriented towards science and technology. You go to Newe Town in Anambra State, Nigeria today, that is where you get all manner of spare parts replicated and fabricated. Go to Aba, you'll be amazed of what people are producing. Fabrics of all kinds, little materials of all kinds and others in other states of the country. Under political development. We want a Nigeria that is politically stable. What we want an Africa that is politically stable. This involves stability in government, democracy, rule of law, free and fair election, good governance. History must feature in our curriculum. Legislation should be in place that history must remain a core subject in our curriculum, whether in secondary sociology, social studies, civic education, or history. All this can be re-emphasized. In the past few years, the Nigerian government removed history from our curriculum. And when you don't know your history, when you don't know anything about your identity, you continue to create history. But thank God for the present regime. The Minister of Education brought in an integrated history game back to the curriculum. And that is where you will know where and what you are and what and how you want people to address you. If you don't know where you are coming from, you will not know where you are going to. Right. Then, under social development, that includes values, education, health, and language. Our language is our identity. Our language could as well be integrated in our curriculum and made a core subject if not using our languages to teach all the subjects in our schools. Values were very critical issues. Character first before learning. Values give meaning to society. Values ought to be taught constantly. Every child was a people that had values. They were taught at home respect for elders, for God or deity, for authority, for rules and regulations. Curriculum reform should lay greater emphasis on values. If people are if, if possible, a subject should be made a core subject on values as part of curriculum. We have the following values, economic values, religious values, social values, and political values. A curriculum should be developed in these aspects on values so that child does not forget any of these from primary to tertiary levels. Education. Education is a greater heritage in Igbo land. People who are ready to forgo their meals to acquire education. Our people cherish education and have passion for it in all aspects. Education is life. It makes one function appropriately in the society. However, it was observed that the curriculum fails to address societal issues and even educational issues. Nigerian government saw it as an important task to find a way to, of making the curriculum more meaningful and effective as to meet the needs of the education system individuals and the society at large. This move was done by introducing entrepreneurship in our curriculum as a core and compulsory cause, despite your area of specialization, 
in 2007, which now reflected most skills and trade traits embedded in our arts, culture, and heritage. Entrepreneurship. This is a kind of education that keeps one with valuable skills. It makes one to be self-reliant, financially relevant, and independent. It makes one employers of labor, not seekers of labor. It develops in one entrepreneurial mindset. It makes one a creator of wealth and so on. In Nigeria and business education programs in particular, curriculum is designed to help students develop variable skills that enable them to function appropriately in the society and as well in business activities. These valuable skills are entrepreneurship skills, business skills, marketing skills, accounting skills, innovative skills, communication skills, leadership skills, managerial skills, and many others. It helps them to become entrepreneurs and employers of labor. It helps them to acquire a variety of trade skills that can enable them to establish small scale businesses. It makes them to be self reliant and financially independent. These trade skills are at work, tie and dye, shoe making, beads making, confectionery, poultry farming, agricultural farming, fish farming, fashion designing, hairdressing, and many more. And many more. Challenges faced in the integration of entrepreneurship in our curriculum are inadequate fund, lack of enabling environment, lack of essential materials and facilities, lack of modern technological equipment, and so many others. We don't have adequate funds to employ the competent personnel or even artisans that can teach those skills in our schools, we don't have enough fund to give the materials, the facilities, the equipment that are needed to carry on with those skills. And we find out that once you don't have enough fund, you continue to dwell on theories instead of practice, instead of putting it in practice and learning those skills practically to enable you to fit in in the society and function appropriately. Lack of enabling environment. The environment we found ourselves is not helping us. It's not helping matters as far as entrepreneurship is concerned. The environment where you find it difficult to have light, the environment where you don't even, I mean, facilities are lacking, the environment where ICT is a problem, for you to get connected, you must have your data. There is no Wi-Fi, free Wi-Fi in our schools, and that has been a problem and a challenge in this integration. Lack of essential materials and facilities, lack of modern technological equipment, and so many others. In conclusion, a curriculum reform must take care of both individuals and societal needs in terms of our values, culture, heritage, exhibitions, and trade skills. A curriculum reform should be the one that meet the needs of education system and to make education more meaningful and effective. A curriculum reform should be able to solve our society problems. Mm -hmm. Unemployment, with so many others. A curriculum reform should be able to make our country could be economically, scientifically, technologically, politically, and socially stable. These on the for me, curriculum must reflect the art, values, culture and heritage of our society, Africa in particular. We must have a curriculum that will reflect our lives in terms of values, culture and heritage. A curriculum that will reflect indeed who we are and what we stand for as Nigerians and Africans. A curriculum that can stand the test of time in Nigeria and Africa. A curriculum that will be cherished and admired in the whole world. A curriculum that will help us in building the Nigeria and Africa we want. All this will give us the Africa we want and the Nigeria we want. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Um, time. Yes, uh, I'm very grateful. 
for the presentation, Dr. Angela. Yes, uh, that was great. Uh, the last one, which I want to start with, she says, a curricula that reflects who we are. Uh, this one always touches me. Of course, uh, colonialism came and went away, but some of us, we still want to follow it because you yeah. see, uh, we do the bleachings, we do the what, what, but they say black is beauty. And then she talked about uh, our fashion design and hair. If we maintain it, what we as people elsewhere in other continents also saying, we want this fashion design, we want this hair design, we want this fabric design. As uh, she went on to address uh, uh, issues of entrepreneurship in relation to arts, uh, culture, and our heritage, good governance, values, our uh, history, and uh, what is in the history that is being taught in schools, and use of traditional names really touched me. My name is Violet Makuku, but all my children are named in Shona names. Tariro means hope, uh, Tatenda means thank you, Tawonga means thank you, and then uh, uh, Wazana means let's come together and unite. Thank you very much. Um, that has been so insightful. From Nigeria, we move on to Cameroon. And uh, from Cameroon, we will come to Ghana. And from Ghana, we go to Uganda. From Uganda, we go to Ethiopia. So, Pamela, may you please uh, introduce to us um, Professor Valentine from Cameroon. And we, uh, we are still on curricular reform with all these uh, six presenters. And I think uh, we want to hear more of curricular reform. Thank you. Thank you, Doc. Professor Valentine Bafega in Galim is a researcher and teacher in the University of Bamenda. He is the chair of philosophy in higher teacher training college, Bambili, and at the same time, chair of educational foundations in the faculty of education in the Finn University. As a philosopher of education, he is very keen on decolonizing the curriculum by advocating back to roots in African arts, culture, and heritage. Over to you, Prof. Ngali. So what I Thank just you. said before, he, he, as he's preparing to come on board, is that we should take note of our questions and our comments so that all presentations go smoothly when we are done. We are now going to check what is in the chat panel. We are also going to now pick people to question and also to give their comments at the end so that we have a smooth flow of presentations. Thank you. Over to you, Professor Valentine. Thank you very much, uh, the coordinators, for this wonderful opportunity. Um, um, Arts, culture, and heritage levers for building the Africa we want. And my topic for the day is food cooked in borrowed pots cannot kill hunger. Curricular perspectives from John Dewey's Pedagogy of Interest and Julius Nyerere's Ujama. Uh, this topic is inspired by the Swahili proverb, food cooked in borrowed pots cannot kill hunger. And uh, I will be, I'm looking at it from a cross-cultural perspective, that is from the Western philosopher John Dewey and the African philosopher Ujama to justify the type of curriculum we want for Africa. And um, I will argue that uh, if the curriculum that is put in place does not reflect the needs, the interests, the nature, and the experiences of the persons concerned, then it is a form of alienation and indoctrination. John Dewey would consider it as indoctrination and Ujama would consider it as alienation. Then, from the objective, we have to say that we have to overcome this type of uh, curricular vices. Uh, that, that is the one that alienates, the one that intro, intro, indoctrinates by putting in place those that will reflect our needs. I, the previous speaker already made the clarification of terms and I'm very happy because that set me now the pace to just proceed with the content of my presentation. And um, we are still going to argue that uh, uh, we don't have to be, we are not just going to dismiss the colonial heritage, but we are going to see the extent to which it is relevant to our needs 
by being informed by the philosophy of conscientism of Kwame Nkrumah. Uh, and we say that some reasons for conflicts and disorder in Africa is because we are not built on our identity. If we look at the present situation of Cameroon, we find the conflict of colonial cultures in the educational system of Cameroon and had, us, uh, had an impact on prolonged conflict for a period of five years. And we see the impact that colonial cultures can make. And we ask ourselves, are we, being, are we, are we products of colonialism? Where is our own identity? Where is our culture in the school system that we fight for what was brought to us from, 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 from foreigners? Those are the reasons that we ask. And within this context, I would like to begin from African arts in curricular reforms. How do we exploit African arts in curricular reforms? I'm saying that the works of arts provoked wonder and imagination in children. And you take, for example, an engaging theme, a novel, an opera, or a dance, music performance, painting, and sculpture, they will captivate the, the attentions of children. And this is what John Dewey calls aesthetic education. And this has to be content dependent. It is context dependent. So you exploit the artistic uh, experiences of Africa and you involve them into the school system so that the children could be able to learn from their own experiences. Um, consider our traditional narratives, the songs and dance, crafts, works and paintings, which could be exploited to build the creative and imaginative powers of learners. The, the, these are very valuable uh, experiences, educational experiences that we often neglect in the development of our curriculum. Art presents the holistic dimension of the African, that is the material and the spiritual. Yeah? Because our school systems have neglected the spiritual dimension of the African person. If you look at the African worldview, the African worldview is reflected in the African arts where you have the, both the spiritual and the, the physical world. But then when you look at the exigencies of the present school systems, you understand that uh, the spiritual dimension has been neglected seriously. And that constitutes one of the serious crises of education today. I will tell you that in our school curriculum in Cameroon, religious studies is considered in the margins. It's put in the margins. It is not considered as a serious subject after your uh, advanced level and not considered as a subject that can permit you to further your education in the university. And as a result of that, the, the, the student come to understand that this particular aspect of life counts for nothing in their academic success. And this could sink very, very serious dangers for the society. The spiritual dimension of the African must be taken into consideration in the curricular reforms. And I say African arts in school is a celebration of identity and personality. We have to preserve the African culture and the ancestral heritage because these are avenues to reinforce moral values, to restore our self-esteem and values, and to enhance an understanding of the African worldview. That's the view of Ubuntu, of communalism. The African is a man of togetherness and a sense of oneness. And these are um, perspectives that could be integrated into the school pedagogy an African doesn't function as an individual, he functions as a corporate body. And we ask ourselves, how many of the school systems take into pedagogic practices take into consideration the uh, cooperative learning as a way at, at the same time, cooperative uh, assessment in groups? Because in Africa, we consider that uh, we, we are one another's keeper and the strength of one person complements the weakness of the other. We work as a corporate body. And these are values that need to be integrated in the African school system, both from the teaching perspective and from the perspective of evaluation. Then, how can we approach the African arts in a world of a digital age? The digital age provides a better platform for the marketing and preservation of African arts. Children and youth today belong to an Android world, an Android generation. And we say that the African students are not exempted <laughs> from this reality. The African children are not exempted from this reality and they are therefore exposed to social morality as seen in the social media. But then African arts and culture and the heritage stand as a bulwark against the vices that are exposed to our children in the social media. 
African researchers, scholars, and designers to exploit these digital facilities to conserve culture and identity and heritage. I am thinking that we are not going to go back to the days of storytelling by the fireside, but some of these stories, some of these traditional narratives could be translated into cartoon films, could be translated into the digital devices, which constitute part of the instance of the African children so that they can now exploit it for their moral and intellectual development. When we look at the curriculum reforms as a way forward, we think that curricular values in African institutions need to consider the experiences of the people. These African experiences are expressed in their works of art. Art is an expression of the will of the people. With the inspiration from Ujama, agriculture is at the center of the lives of the Africans. And African arts express this agrarian uh, interest within the lives of the Africa. Africa is very rich with vast land. Africa is very rich with fertile land. But then how much of the school systems in Africa take into consideration this agrarian economy, which is the backbone of our economy, which constitutes a great source of wealth. It becomes more puzzling when countries in Africa, from countries in Africa import rice, gari, chocolate, whereas they have fertile land and they are the highest producers of cocoa, the highest producers of cassava. And it, it becomes puzzling that where is the problem? What is the reason for all these? African universities possess schools of engineering, yet they hire engineers from abroad to carry out projects at exorbitant prices. And we ask ourselves, what is it? Has integration been used as a weapon for the exploitation of the African. Because if you look at Paulo Freire, he would tell you that education is like a weapon. The education of the, of the, of the colonized is a weapon that could be used to exploit Africa. And Africa has to be sensitive to this. What can we do to add value to the products that are produced in Africa? How do we exploit these our products and let the people buy finished products and let us be able to generate wealth for the African continent? We, don't, we, we shouldn't import chocolates and from Europe and Asia. Meanwhile, we have the best cocoa produced in the world. Cameroon has the fourth best cocoa in the world, but yet chocolates are imported from France. Then you question yourself, what, what we talk about food sciences and, 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 and technology, what is happening to the African scholars and the African universities that have to effect change in curricular development? Um, the constant request for aid and import of food with rich and vast fertile lands betray lack of vision in the African scholars and African entrepreneurship. But then where is the problem? Where is the forum? I continue to say food cooked in borrowed pots cannot kill hunger. The present African institutions suffer from a high degree of educational alienation. What are the values in the curriculum? These values betray the colonial heritage that perpetuate mental slavery as well as intellectual subordination. The curricula of most of the institutions preserves the values, culture, and heritage of the colonial masters. And then in that case, the call for action in this case is decolonizing the curriculum. We have to undergo a decolonization process of the curriculum. And in this case, we have to reinstitute our cultural heritage in schools. African identity should be reflected in the pedagogic practices and innovations in schools, back to roots in a digital age, and then the consideration of the national languages in the teaching of science, as already explained by a previous speaker, and then African value of Ubuntu and communalism should constitute best pedagogic practices in African institutions. Then we have to assume responsibility. Assuming responsibility to conserve the culture. Education is a means for conservation and it is also radical. So we need to preserve cultural heritage that requires the means to do the preservation. And then the identity of the teacher constitutes the means of preserving cultural heritage because the teacher represents the society and the teacher must be a reflection of the African. Culture, a reflection of Africans will be transmitted from one generation to another. Then we conclude with the open-mindedness in curricular reforms. Uh, another African proverb holds that the goat does not eat all the grass it sees. We are drawing inspiration from the conscientious of Kwame Nkrumah to say that it is not all that is bad in the colonial heritage, but then Kwame Nkrumah talks about the critical consumption of ideas that were left to us by the colonial uh, masters. 
So there are commendable values in colonial education, but there is a need for critical selection. Which of these needs to respond to the needs and interests, experiences and exigencies of the African? There are, we need to get into these values that will respond to our needs and lead to the development of Africa. And with this, the curricular reform will reflect the identity, will reflect the culture and the, the heritage of the people we are trying, that we want to have in the present Africa. Thank you for your key attention. Thank you very much uh, for a wonderful presentation. And uh, somebody in the chat panel just asked, so where is the problem? Is it coming from our houses or it's coming from our neighbors? I think it's both because we are competing uh, to be like the colonizers, yet uh, former colonizers, yet on our own, we have uh, the best food in the continent, highly nutritious and also medicinal. There's somebody who is going to tackle that aspect at some uh, stage. Let me just quickly summarize what Professor Valentine all the way from Cameroon uh, said. He talked of African values, of oneness, of cooperation, of coordination, and that is very, very key. He talked about the work of art uh, and said that uh, these are very good uh, tools for teaching and learning the dance, the sculpture, the music, the novels, and these can really be used for effective teaching and learning uh, so that uh, the concept being taught can really be engraved within uh, the students. Deficiencies in the school curricula, religious studies not there, but I can tell you that uh, uh, whether God and Allah are there or not, definitely religious studies have helped us uh, to bring about moral people with integrity because we really check and see the moral values that are taught uh, through uh, religious studies. And we really need to take that on board. Cooperative learning, we are one another skipper and together we stand strong. We need also to exploit digital facilities, he said it, to preserve our arts, culture, and heritage for moral development. And this is where I continue to bring back the issue of interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary curricula. Arts, culture, heritage, now in the curricula, should you have ICT components in them as they are being taught? Because he rightly said, we cannot go and preserve now by the fireside when we have our uh, internet and uh, ICT technologies. All those things should be used. Uh, shunning our own food, I reiterate, he asked, why are we hiring engineers when we have our own? our food and science technology, what are they doing? So, you know, it reminds me of the Eskimos that uh, they survive in snow and they've learned to use snow and ice to construct their homes. So food from borrowed pots don't end hunger. Let's be like the Eskimos. Decolonize is the curricula, but we need to decolonize the mind first select the good things uh, from what we got from the former colonies, and I think that is in order. In the interest of time, now we are going to uh, call upon um, uh, engineer and we shared to be on board because let's just hear a male and a female voice, a male and a female voice. Recording in progress. Hello, Pamela. Right. Uh, do we have uh, engineer Enke on board? 
Pamela, are you here? I'm here. <laughs> Pamela, are you back on board? Yes, please. I'm sorry I went off. Okay, I also went off. Can you introduce Engineer Enke from Uganda? Because we want to alternate male, female, male, female. Yes, please. Yes, and then after uh, it will be Dr. Daniel Abreko. Yes, please. Thank you, Doc. So she is an agriculture engineer, bioethicist with more than 18 years of professional experience in Eastern and Southern Africa. Currently, she is a co founder and chair innovation and business management of the Farm Biotechnology and Traditional Medicine Center at the Imbarara University of Science and Technology, Imbarara, Uganda. She has vast experience in conducting project and proposal evaluations, strategic planning, feasibility studies, and organization development. Engineer Wei, shares over to you, please. Thank you very much for the elaborate introduction and for the opportunity to present in this forum. I will speak under the sub team curriculum reforms and um, giving you some ideas on how to integrate indigenous knowledge into curriculum. As you know, indigenous knowledge is a combination of knowledge in various fields, including the, the in, environment, science, technology, medicine, politics, law, traditional organization of communities and spirituality. Indigenous knowledge exists since human life started. So it's the oldest knowledge on uh, human half on earth. It has guided communities on all ways of life, including food, nutrition, health, social setting and protection. We need to go back to the roots, integrating indigenous knowledge in the curriculum from nursery school to university. It's very important to start from the start of the human development up to the end. Closing the generation gap by integrating elders in school and university, especially in delivering knowledge and indigenous knowledge it's actually good that sometimes the indigenous knowledge holders are the direct teachers to the students and not through lecturers or teachers, because that is like you're getting secondhand knowledge, not the straight original knowledge. So possible areas of integrating indigenous knowledge in the existing curricula is from the angle of food culture agriculture, health, social, and engineering. I'm just giving you an overview. For example, culture, we have the performing art, music, dance, and drama, and storytelling, learning from various national and regional cultures will help the child to understand diversity and also appreciate diversity, and in future will have more experience in intercultural collaboration. We can also use music, dance and drama as a medium of content delivery. In contemporary classroom, most of the delivery is front to back, means the teacher stands in front and teaches by talking and demonstrating towards the student. But there are also other ways of uh, delivering medium of for example, music, dance and drama, storytelling, and videos and other mediums to make the content delivery more interesting for the child and make learning fun or not learning a chore. Fine arts can also be used to teach and learn about day-to-day -day solution. For example, learning to appreciate local ancient and contemporary art and styles, creating day-to-day -day items using art, pottery, basket making, jewelry making, fashion design. So these small 
skills you impact to the students may in future become their businesses on their self-employment opportunities. And in this contemporary education systems, usually the education is done to create employees, to create administrators and, and bureaucrats, but less focusing on creating entrepreneurs and self-employed people. When I'm going to the health, it is one aspect of health is nutrition and preventive medicine, disease prevention to prophylaxis. For example, in Congo and on some part in Uganda, Artemisia annua plants or the Artemisia africa plants are used for preventing malaria as a simple tea taken once a week and you don't get malaria. So there are simple things one can do on teaching to make some prophylaxis. Wound healing is another, there are simple plants known for when you have a small wound, just wrap the plant on it and it heals faster. Nutritional foods and beverage making. There are many indigenous foods and vegetables, which unfortunately many urban children so may not know how to, how to make them, how to make them edible, how to make food and beverages out of them, and also to make them attractive for the consumer. Traditional sports and games. Yeah, as, as you know, in school, we need uh, to have the brain and physical development. Now, there are usually I see volleyball, football, the, the, the usual Western games only played and done gymnastics and so on. So why not integrating also traditional ball games, board games, and other games which are locally traditional based? Health, again, home remedy making, putting aspects in the curriculum on home herbal garden, how to make them, how to select the plants using the local knowledge holders and also other authorities, harvesting and storage of the herbs cultivated and then making simple cosmetics and medicine for home use, home remedies. The next is agriculture. Schools already have home gardens. They have home and school gardens. Now, in the school, the, the gardens can be used to foster the use of, indi of indigenous vegetables on fruits, cultivation so that the students learn how to cultivate them for the further use in the adulthood. And also to training students in how to establish home herbal gardens. So when they go back home, they can also help the parents who may not know how to do it. And also important is the seed collection and conservation of indigenous agriculture crops. So students can be taught basics on traditional seed selection and collection, and also basics on good but simplified seed storage. These are very vital knowledge which the children bring back home to their communities and also helping to improve the agriculture. Social science. Bringing the Ubuntu philosophy to the classroom. Bring the meanings and the practical samples to the learners. Alternative conflict resolution. Usually when a conflict in the community happens, a chicken thief goes to prison. That is the west of the human capital. So we need to see how alternative solution to conflict resolution can be used and also taught so people know about that's not only being locked up in prison when you're doing something wrong and pre uh, presenting alternative conflict resolutions as a part of the curriculum. Another one in social science is living together, forms of teamwork and group engagement. Organizing group work in curriculum delivery and foster collaborative projects, again, mainly in schools, in the urban and rural schools, which are not highly financed, 
teaching is frontal teaching and less practical oriented. And that is of course not good. It's important to have practical, practical teaching and also having collaborative projects and group work. And creative, creating and practical engagement with indigenous knowledge holders. So in classroom, if the teacher teaches from January to December, it's also not very interesting to the, the students. Let them also experience other way of knowledge transmission and knowledge, knowledge providers. And these could be indigenous knowledge holders through storytelling, artisans, healers, engineering, integrating indigenous knowledge wisdoms in design and buildings. Now, even in school, basics on buildings, maintenance and repair in rural, rural dwellings, basics in home cleaning and home hygiene, traditional pest and disease prevention. Practical experience in building simple dwellings is also an important skill. So schools should provide knowledge and skills, very important, a mix of knowledge and skills for the practical survival later. Basics in tool making and maintenance and repair. So I'm coming to the more specialized. Now in the specialized curriculum on indigenous knowledge that is developing new courses in higher education on natural products like traditional medicine, pharmacognosy, food science and nutrition, architecture and performing arts. Now these are courses in health practitioners, traditional artisans, traditional architects, storytellers, entrepreneurs and community elders to come into the classroom and actually practically teach and demonstrate in the classroom. So here, that's my last slide. Uh, just a sample of some creative uh, products of the students and staff of my center, which is called Pharmaceutical Biotechnology and Traditional Medicine Center. Thank you very much, and your comments and questions are welcome. Yes, um, thank you very much uh, for uh, a wonderful presentation. I start with the last one, integration. And has uh, been said we would out of it. And this is one aspect which is really lacking. If people were to increase uh, the value of uh, the wild fruits that we have and uh, the herbs that we have, where do you think Africa would be or would go? So these are some of the things which we want to really concentrate on. Uh, can I quickly highlight uh, some of the things, important things which she said also, use of our music, drama, storytelling to make engraved memories in our students and uh, children. Health, nutrition, she touched on integrative traditional. May you please um, stop sharing maybe, thank you. Right. Uh, food and agriculture, social sciences and on social sciences, she actually divided it into oneness, teamwork, practical teaching, and she touched on engineering and architecture, whereby we can still borrow from what we have in our communities and make sure we incorporate it into the curricula. I thank you very much, engineer, for uh, that insightful presentation. Just for interest sake, I just want to read through some of the countries which we have here, Uganda, Zimbabwe, Nigeria, Egypt, Botswana, Cameroon, Kenya, Ethiopia, Tanzania, Somaliland, Zambia, Ghana, and these are the African countries which we have, and we also have the, uh, Sri Lanka. Uh, thank you very much. We continue to encourage you to post uh, the country where you are coming from uh, in case we have uh, not announced uh, the country where you are coming from. Over to you, Pamela. Can you introduce uh, to us 
Dr. Daniel uh, Agweko, uh, all the way to Ghana, from uh, Nigeria to Cameroon to Uganda, and now to Ghana. Thank you very much. Thank you, Doc. Dr. Daniel Agbeko has 18 years of practical experience and technical knowledge in banking and entrepreneurship. Five years of experience in lecturing and coaching students to start their own businesses locally and on the international platform. He is a consultant to the German Technical Corporation, Credit Union Association in Ghana, and a lecturer as well as the deputy director of TVERC at Old Technical University. Dr. Daniel holds a PhD in finance and entrepreneurship from the University of Wageningen in Netherlands. Over to you, Dr. Daniel. You are most welcome. Please, Dr. Amira Hamdi, may you uh, prepare for your presentation after which uh, that is Egypt, after which we are going to move to Ethiopia, all the way to Ethiopia from Egypt, from Ghana. Go ahead, uh, Dr. Daniel, you are most welcome. Okay, I'm trying to upload the slide. Give me two minutes. I'll upload and then come back to you. Okay, while it is uploading, I learned also that uh, we have uh, the DRC, Republic of Congo, we have uh, Namibia, we have uh, Botswana, uh, we have uh, Malaysia and we have Malawi. Uh, thank you very much. That's uh, very good. Can we continue to post the countries from where we are coming from? You can go ahead. Um, are we on Dr. Daniel? Good. Thank you. All right, um, thank you very much. Um, I'll be giving a small background on the... Please, can you all hear me? Yes. Please, can you all hear me? Uh, yes, uh, we can hear you. We are timing you. Uh, in 15 or so minutes, we will uh, stop you. So I can see you have got a lot of slides. And uh, it's my sincere hope that uh, you will be able to uh, present all of them within oh. the 15 minutes. Thank you. Oh. All right, thank you too. All right. Um, Can you put full screen? Okay, full screen, full screen. It's okay if you can't just go ahead then in the interest of time. Hello, Doc. Yes, I'm here. All right. Yes, please go ahead in the interest of time. All right. In, in 15 minutes, I'll be finished. Basically, okay. I, want, I want to give a brief background on the need for review of the curriculum. Right. Um, I, from an educational system, normally there's a lot of unemployment in the countries, in all the African countries. The question is, why do we think that there are a lot of unemployment? And the basic answer is that our educational system and curriculum is one of the reasons why we have this unemployment cancer in the various African countries. Now, the reason is that in most of these African countries, you realize that we teach only knowledge the acquisition of knowledge is one of the main factors. First, we leave attitude and skills because you know that attitude has a lot to offer when you want to be holistic in everything that you do. But unfortunately, we leave attitude and skills and teach only knowledge, which is the acquisition of information. Ideally, if you want to be successful in whatever you do, you need knowledge, skills, and attitude. But unfortunately, our educational system is focusing on only the acquisition of knowledge, which is a problem. Now, uh, uh, a current World Bank report is saying that 
uh, uh, very soon, there is going to be 48% unemployment. That's the 2016 report, right? Now, when you look at the 2018 report from the World Bank, it also focuses on the same issue that unemployment is going to increase and the type of uh, graduates that will produce will not be very effective in growing the economy of these various countries. Now, current research in one of the universities in Ghana, that is Legon, has it that every 100 students that complete the university, it is likely that only 10 will be able to get jobs. And that is very, very much alarming. Our president, um, Uhuru Kenyatta, said something. And what he said is that business cannot offer you the, the education, can offer you a job, but we don't train people to be very much vested in business. We only train people in the job market or in education for jobs, but not for business. And that is a challenge. Now, what we all have to know is that salary is not cost of income, all, all, what we have to know is that salary uh, is, is only a source of income. And uh, if you want to get out of poverty, then you need to do business as well. But unfortunately, we train uh, students to be able to come out of the university and get only salary. Now, some few uh, years back in Ghana, we had about uh, three universities. And yesterday, when I was checking a number of universities, we have about 67 universities in Ghana. And the question is, have the job avenues increased uh, 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 to this level? And the answer is a big no. Now, the question I always ask is that the curriculum used in these universities, when the universities were only three. May you please be closer to your microphone? Excuse me. OK. Yes, uh, your volume is going lower and lower, and consider increasing your volume too. Okay. Now, what I am saying is that the universities were only three uh, and some years back, and now they are 67. And the big question is has the top avenues increased commercially to this, which is a big no, and that is a very, very big. Now, what should we review the curriculum? Like I have already said, to be able to review the curriculum, we need to look at competence-based training. We need to uh, uh, enforce the knowledge that we, we, we deliver to our students. We need to add skills, and we also need to imbibe a, a good attitude in our students. And that, I think, is lacking. Why am I saying it's lacking? Uh, it is lacking a little bit because when you look at the knowledge that we impact our students with tasks, which are possible, we give them intelligent coaching. That is IQ. We forget about emotional intelligence, social intelligence, and diversity coaching. So what are these coaches and people? The intelligence coaches only measure somebody's comprehension and how to solve mathematics, memorize things, and that is what we are focusing on. We train the students on this, they memorize whatever they are supposed to memorize, and then they give it back to us, which is not helping us anyway. Emotional intelligence normally talks about being honest, being respectful, which is enshrined in our cultural heritage, which gradually we are moving away from. Social quotient is also very, very important. It measures our network with friends and people. But this is not very much embedded in our curriculum. And so fourth uh, quotient, which is the adversity quotient, which is also very, very critical, but unfortunately, we are not teaching this in our various universities because this question enables a student to be able to face challenges in his life after he has graduated from the university. Now, I am also saying that we should be able to teach skills, but unfortunately, we only touch knowledge and then we measure knowledge. If I have my own way going forward, the project work, the thesis, and the dissertations should be scrapped. And then we should, we should measure tangible projects. A colleague was talking right now, and he talked about how cocoa, cassava, chocolate is all being imported from outside, from Europe. We have the best cocoa, yet we import, uh, we import chocolate. What we can do is that we'll give the students the knowledge and be able to skills and then manufacture some of these things with our raw materials. And I will be getting marks for that. 
And unfortunately, with this uh, 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 and things I'm talking about, most of the universities don't have the plagiarism software that we use to check this uh, plagiarism analysis. So at the end of the day, they give us just written uh, uh, theories, and then we just take it and give them back. This is not going to help us much. Now, how do we influence attitude? A lot of uh, things have been said about attitude, and what we are saying is that by the fire side, our children, this can be it can be involved in their attitude and thought in schools. This is what in schools right now. We all know that education experience and environment influences attitude. And we have to create a good environment and create a knowledge that our heritage has. And then we should all know that we have knowledge, we have skills. What is holding it up and what is most important is the attitude. And once we forget to, 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 to train our students on attitude, then we will have a, a, a problem. In a nutshell, all that I'm saying today is that the curriculum should include training, knowledge, skills, and attitude. And we should prepare our students not for jobs, but for business. If you are able to enter knowledge, skills, and attitude to them from the word go. And this, I think, should be done. Uh, to the students when they are very young, not when they are in the universities. The curriculum is basic tools where we have to teach them the knowledge, the skills, and the attitude, and incorporate the uh, uh, activity of starting their own business and not training them for jobs. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Daniel. Um, you have talked much uh, along the dimensions of uh, uh, attitude and uh, holistic teaching, as well as the competencies that uh, need to be inculcated in our uh, children, whether they are school pupils or students in universities. What is of uh, importance, which I also got in relation to uh, the theme we are having now is that instead of having these theoretical projects, which we undertake in three, four years at undergrad, master's and PhD, maybe it is better now to say with the knowledge and skills that uh, our students do get, uh, they should do tangible projects. That is one thing which I picked. Um, thank you very much. Uh, Doc, for that presentation. Uh, before we go to Dr. Amira, I just want to add more countries which are with us here today. We have Namibia, Malaysia, DRC, Malawi, and South Africa. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, mm. Over to you, Pamela, to introduce uh, Dr. Amira. Um, thank you, Doc. Dr. Amira Hamdi is a lecturer of, is a lecturer for interior design, the co-department faculty of arts and design at Ferris University, and a former lecturer at Interior Architecture Department, faculty of engineering and Arab at Arab Academy for Science and Technology. Dr. Amira Hamdi, please have the floor. Thank you a lot, Pamela, and thank you, Dr. Vida, for sharing me in that beautiful event. Congratulations, AAAU, for uh, what you have done and impacted our, uh, our development till now. Indeed, it's an honor being among you with one of the dear themes that I've always had the pleasure to talk about, which is an Egyptian identity and our identity within the design of the thing, which is more um, uh, concerned with my field which is furniture design and designing and how we reform the academic curriculum to enlighten that point. I hope my speech will meet your expectation. Looking forward, and I'm sharing my screen for you now. Is it clear for you now? Yes, we can see it. Okay. Okay, uh, I'm talking about the furniture design identity and how to 
uh, impact the furniture design, uh, identity of our Egyptian identity and our African background inside the furniture, inside the design for the curriculum of the children, uh, curriculum of the students and, under, and undergraduates in the academic field. Okay. Now, in many countries and throughout the modern era of educational change, curriculum innovation has been regarded as essential strategy for educational reform and listed positive impact of our recent history in Egypt for the educational change. The undergraduates need that process of making changes to the curriculum with the intent of making learning and teaching more meaningful, more meaningful, effective, and more relative to our Egyptian employment market. Assessing to the relative uh, importance of these issues uh, for curriculum reform, a new vision in the curriculum of furniture design in interior design department, Faculty of Arts and Design, Paris University, Alexandria, Egypt, has been introduced. Now, I always ask my students when they listen to my lectures, what 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 circle would you would you notice more in this slide? And they always have the same answer. They say the red circle. Why is it? Why did you notice first? And they say because it's different, not because it's red and not because it's the same side, because it's different. They always study the history of furniture design uh, in their uh, uh, just as they are, as the history of the designs and always as they used to perform in our heritage. And they ask it to perform their designs and their projects and their assignments in the same method. So, so we come out with um, designers. So designers have to make and think different uh, in a way of thinking and in the way of design. So uh, we have to find the concept of design that we can share uh, in our, uh, our designs. Sorry, I, I, I was just connecting my charger. Okay, thank you. Now, between the originality of these designs and our heritage and modernity, pending of this uh, on the modern days, simple fabricator of furniture, of furniture design has been introduced to seek and offer the contemporary luxury along with a strong Egyptian identity. Assessing the relative importance for these issues, a new ident a new furniture design have been introduced. My curriculum. In, the, in my university, I uh, aim to achieve a new furniture production line that carries proudly the Egyptian identity and inspired by Egyptian theme motifs such as Quranic culture, Africa and Nubian heritage, meeting with the current requirements of furniture marketing, going with the global economy intent or, uh, on a knowledge society uh, and programming for uh, moving the shifting from traditional and uh, uh, authorized approaches to a new ideas and development under a three curriculum reforms initiative, which is why we do all of this, why we change our ideas. That's because of the social and economic challenges that Egypt is facing nowadays. The, the shifting uh, for the corona thing from the teacher centering centered uh, approach to a learner uh, centered approach and external views uh, about the Egyptian market and the quality of the Egyptian products. Uh, and how do we invade the, the global marketing? Uh, government pressure for the cultural transmission and environmental adaptation for our new ideas, educational technologies, which are the students on the, the undergraduates are facing nowadays, they always open-minded for a new programs and inserting the new programs in their uh, education. Uh, the, th the second thing is uh, what, well, yeah, how, how am I making the content of my curriculum? I'm making and preparing this content of my curriculum and do it to the students uh, to enlighten the students uh, to be graduated as designers. So how can you be a designer in innovation or giving him a course plan, which is composed of lectures, uh, practical uh, tutorials and interactive learning with tutorials and field projects. And at the end of my, uh, my uh, course planning, I take a photo for the whole program and they achieve uh, an exhibition, an outdoor exhibition for the new trends and the new ideas which every group has, it seems, at each design. And this is one of my 
Um, and this is how we reach this and uh, with one of my three stages conceptual designs, which is concept sketches and computer aided design. Now, uh, the first thing that I'm now showing you, I'm finished with my uh, uh, speech. Now I'm showing you one of uh, some of my examples for my students, which uh, how we uh, perform uh, these ideas. Uh, this group of uh, this group of uh, students uh, made the idea from the Egyptian uh, fingerprints, and they performed a small maquette for a uh, furniture uh, that carries the identity of the Egyptian designs. Uh, as an Alexandrian military uh, uh, city, they uh, they are also another group of students uh, performed it from the undersea world. And uh, as we are a uh, Mediterranean uh, city in Alexandria, as we know, uh, the seashells, uh, the sea, they, they took the concept and analyzed it to perform this an idea which is different from the other uh, any other ideas of chairs. This is uh, because uh, the, uh, they took from the uh, palm trees and they designed it concept and made it for, through the architectural stages to reach the um, the idea and the concept and perform it actually in an exhibition and it was perfect in our college. Also some of the group of the children took the African and Nubian heritage and used it and uh, modified it to make to, to make it useful also in production of some of the production lines of furniture design as you see some of the sofas uh, with coloring in, in concerning coloring and concerning uh, and, and I, I made up an exhibition for them uh, in the college hall actually uh, we can use the, Nob you know, the Nobian uh, jewelry and heritage for uh, achieving such a beautiful and colorful designs which is different from any other traditional designs uh, finally we used the, some of the groups used also uh, the heritage and culture uh, which is more um, which, which is very rich culture, which is a pharaonic uh, culture. They use also uh, some of the symbols of the pharaonic culture. And I prepared for them this uh, Egyptian designer, which won the first, uh, the first designer, the first creative designer for interior, uh, for furniture designs in Roma, which is Shosha Samir. She's a designer, an Egyptian designer. She won the first place uh, in designing furniture uh, across the whole, the whole world. And she was Egyptian and she was African, you know, and she also designs from the identity of our design. And she took the Horus eye and she analyzed it as a concept and she made a new trend of design, which made a huge uh, innovation and creation and uh, had many likes, actually. And one of my children, uh, one of my students, also a group of students, uh, they took uh, the Bo'aran, which is a very Egyptian old simple, and they analyzed it to reach the uh, the, the, the chair or uh, neutral design. This is a group of uh, students also, and on the right, a group of students, they perform a chair, and here is also a chair, but then on the right, the chair is, has the concept of a lotus flower. They took the lotus flower, which is, was a significant concept uh, uh, for a metaphor, significant metaphor in uh, Iranian culture, and they uh, performed it to use it in a uh, different way and they made it a chair and on the left they used the wing for the queen Nefertiti and they had also a design. This is also from the Goran and uh, as you can see in this project that the, the students uh, photographed the, the stages of the design, the shades of the design from the uh, people who, was, uh, who were uh, helping them in the um, carpentry place then we then to the reaching the, the design in the final place. This is also from the Horus Eye, and this is a word from one of my students. And they, he, um, uh, this group were three boys, actually. Um, they, they reached a the very nice design and also the first place on our uh, whole uh, faculty. Uh, that was a, also uh, inspired from Horus Eye, from our identity. This is from the uh, Egyptian and Pharaoh's uh, jewelry. They took the design and made a bar chair which is a very nice uh, thing, I think. And this uh, from the uh, taking the idea from the pyramids and how they move the pyramids from uh, as an analyzation and they made a library for the books that can be used for everything and can be used for our homes. And it can be also uh, be a production line in the market uh, later. This was also used from the eagle, the Egyptian eagle, which is, uh, uh, I think, from the light, uh, the, 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 the um, uh, I think the uh, it, it also uh, has a significant in you know, the Paris 
uh, in the pharaonic uh, culture. Uh, at the end, I always uh, tell them that uh, uh, this doesn't um, erase that three point, that three um, main points of our design, that the form also uh, always have to follow function. We can't make a thing that uh, we can't make a production point, uh, a, a product uh, of a furniture design that makes it a very beautiful and very um, eye catching, but it can't be used. Uh, it can't be used later. It has to be a functionally uh, used. Uh, the second point, which is um, whenever you design, the less is always more. Uh, and the third thing, uh, I always tell them that when you take a concept, make it after sim uh, analyzation simple and clear to you as it can be clear to others. When you're not here as a student to uh, um, uh, have a word about your project, uh, anyone can see the project and can talk about the project as if you were here. And it can be also useful for others and what is the uh, uh, the main theme and the main point I, I, I end by this slide always every time uh, this bird has a wide vision for all birds but these old birds had a certain vision so you can uh, you have also uh, you have to be always with a wide vision and a wide creative idea so you can see uh, things better and you can see uh, uh, designs better um, which and by ending adding the student flavor, which is a student style. Every student has its style and its line of design. It can be very nice and you can think in a way which is creative. Thank you. I finished, Dr. Matuto. Thank you so much, Dr. Fatima. Thank you. Thank you thank very you. much. Yes. <clears throat> Even before you said uh, that uh, bookshelf was. Uh, 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 borrowed from the shape of the pyramid, I could tell, yeah, this is a representative of the pyramids. Yeah. Thank you for a good presentation. And uh, the key things, Egyptian identity, a bit different. Once again, she showed us a bed which was on its own, while least all the beds were there. And most cases, we are afraid of doing unique things or uh, bringing in a new initiative thinking about the criticism, thinking about what people would say, but surely all those on board, let us be the first to go back and incorporate into our curricula what we are learning here. Be different. Designing with students and doing exhibitions, a functional use, I also got that. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, in terms of um, a curricula, I want to talk particularly about higher and tertiary education, that lecturers do limit themselves unnecessarily. They start saying, if you say we need to include this in the course, we need to include this in the program. They say, no, it takes time. It has to go through Senate, what, what? No, suppose uh, somebody was doing carpentry and then uh, we know in carpentry, we do chairs, we do wardrobes, we do what, and somebody's just introducing something, uh, a design from within and not the uh, designs which were normally used. Does it really need approval? It's an example of a design. And so in at lecturer level, there are certain things you can do without giving excuses of it going through Senate. Like when the locusts came down from Somalia down to Kenya and Uganda, would you wait and say that this is a new phenomenon that so many locusts have moved down? But in your agriculture, you always had um, diseases and pests. And so you take it under pests and say, we are having locusts these days. How can we work on them and also make a contribution? Not to excuse yourself through a, 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 a Senate approval. Thank you very much. We are having wonderful presentations, ladies and gentlemen. Um, now we go to hear a host voice all the way uh, from Ethiopia. This is going to be Dr. Balewe. And after Dr. Balewe, we have uh, two more presenters before we now go into our comments and uh, question and answer session. I can see excellent comments, excellent questions being asked, and 
I can't wait for us to hear responses from our curricula specialists and also from the others who are going to present. Uh, Dr. Balewe, you are going to be introduced by Pamela before you come on board. Over to you, Pamela. Thank you, Doc. Dr. Bello Demisi Kebede is an assistant professor of literature at Addis Ababa University. His teaching and research specializations include ideology, Ethiopian and African theater, film, sociology of literature, arts and culture. He received his doctorate and master's degree in literature from Addis Ababa University. He has been also working as a public and international relations director of Addis Ababa Science and Technology University. He has worked as one of the lead researchers of the Ethiopian Education Roadmap. Having a background of BA, MA, and PhD in literature, he is professional in education, public and international relations, communications, language, media technology, and production and research. He is also the author of academic books and articles. Please have the floor, Dr. Kebede. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon, uh, good evening, all wherever you are. Uh, today I'm going to give uh, a talk on art and democracy uh, from African uh, perspective. And the central argument of my presentation is art and democracy uh, do not have any limited space both exist in unbounded uh, space. Uh, as you all know, uh, the basic principle of democracy is uh, dialogue. Yeah? Uh, if we want to bring democracy, uh, we have to argue, we have to dialogue with others. Then this dialogue at the end of the day uh, gives us a truth and the ultimate goal of uh, democracy is all about truth. So uh, dialogue is often uh, originated from art in general. There are many types of art and all artists show, depict uh, perspectives, dialogues. So art plays a great role in bringing uh, a democracy. Uh, why we worry about uh, democracy? Uh, because democracy uh, often leads Africans to development. Without democracy, there is no development. Without development, there is no peace. So democracy is the cornerstone for all, for everything. So from our perspective, how do we bring democracy? When we say art, uh, uh, briefly, human activities engaged in creating visual, it might include painting, sculpture, architecture, and so on, or auditory, it can include music, or any performing arts like theater, film, dance. This is uh, the brief definition of art. The point is, who are the social actors of art? See, in this definition of art, there are many social actors. Now, when we say arts in general, uh, Africa living in the continent uh, have their own artists. Africans living in the diaspora have their own artists. So when we say art and democracy, which art? African art, right? but Africans living at home and Africans living in the diaspora. At the same time, when you say democracy, democracy within Africa and democracy beyond Africa. So the nexus between art and democracy is infinite, is unbounded. Here in this connection, uh, there is no any uh, agreed definition on the word democracy, but it has to be defined uh, in the means as well as in the end. Democracy can be defined in the process. At the same time, democracy can be defined in its outcome or in its goal, in its end. Uh, many times from our schools, we heard democracy derived from the Greek word demos, meaning 
uh, rule of law, uh, uh, the rule of law by the people, for the people, to the people. This is the common definition. But recently, uh, I have heard uh, a kind of conversation by a Kenyan professor, uh, Patrice Lumumba. He argued that Africa should have her own definition of democracy. It should not uh, import from the West or from somewhere else. Unless Africa defines democracy in her own voice, it is very difficult to apply in Africa. So um, uh, what I say is, if the word democracy is foreign to Africa, at the same time, if the modern definition of art is at the same time is foreign to Africa, how do you negotiate art and democracy from the perspectives of Africa? Uh, here, uh, when we say uh, art and democracy, they have common features, they have similarities. Both democracy and art is all about freedom of speech, all about equality, all about inclusiveness, all about membership, uh, consent, right to life, and so on. Uh, and the key democratic features are respecting basic human rights, multi-party political system, the voting system, or the rule of law, governance system, and citizenship. So as I said before, like Professor Patrick Limumba's logic, if Africa defines her own concept of democracy, how do you harmonize this concept of democracy to the rest of the world? We are living in a globalized world. And can we survive by giving our own definition of democracy at the same time, our own unique definition of art? If that is so, how can we sustain? How can we survive? Uh, here, mm, uh, what I say is uh, always uh, democracy can be related to uh, the literacy level of a given country or a given continent. When the literacy rate in a given country is high, the country becomes democratic because those literate people can ask different questions about the government. They can have also the chance to get information. At the end of the day, they fight against any injustice. So when the education system of the continent, Africa, is improved, the literacy rate is also improved. At the end of the day, this literacy rate improves uh, democracy. The other points in relation to the nexus between art and encounter social scientists, human rights defenders, journalists, and any other social sciences. They study uh, democracy in terms of statistics, databases, empirical evidence, and annual reports. Most of the time, these are facts, dry facts. They are not coated with entertainment. They are not coated with art. So a large portion of the society often misses uh, this report. But when we study art and democracy, people can catch, can capture what democracy is through art. So unlike other social sciences or human rights defenders, art can play a great role in democratizing uh, society. Art and democracy also exist in unbounded space. Africans within the continent and Africans out of the continent all have their own level of democracy, but they worry about their own people, Africa. So their art, wherever they are, can uh, portray the lives of Africa. So artists, stakeholders, 
should not always, uh, you know, limit themselves within a specific boundary. Art and democracy do not have any specific boundary. Of course, the relationship between art and democracy is complex. Here, when art fails in Africa, democracy fails. When democracy fails, art also fails. So to maintain democracy, to restore democracy, art should flourish within the continent. Of course, the relationship between art and democracy is reciprocal. Art is also a test of the democracy. Yeah? We can test our governments using our own art. Uh, uh, the other point is, um, if art and democracy do not have simple relationships, how do we make this relationship smooth to bring development within Africa? I want to ignite uh, by asking uh, you this question. As a way forward, still, the relationship between art and democracy is not clear. It is very complex. It is not understood easily. And I close up, I wind up my speech by asking the following few questions for your further research. Here, the continent has more than 55 countries and different writings, literary works, artistic products, often come to the market. My point is, what are the thematic parallels and divergence among African arts? What are the motives, the preoccupations, the thematic parallels? This is my first question. The second is, to what extent do African artists feature the democratic nature of the present Africa? The other is, how do our writers or our artists choose their topics? Are they inclined to the government? Are they pro to the government? Or are they pro to the mass, to the people? Sometimes our art might not be democratic. Our art might be undemocratic. Sometimes the art might be only uh, belongs to a few individuals to the few elites, instead of serving the masses, our art sometimes might favor the interest of the few. So to what extent African art is loyal, genuine to the mass? Or in other words, are our artists democratic by themselves? What? Challenges do our artists, African artists face, either living here in the continent or in the diaspora? How does each artist produce his works? Based on the knowledge of his or her society, or simply based on imagination, or simply based on his own or her own interest? These questions uh, should be answered. So as a closing remark, I would like to say the relationship between art and democracy is not still clear here in the context of Africa, but art can contribute a lot to democracy. At the same time, democracy can contribute a lot to production of art, and both of them do not have any specific boundaries. They are limitless. They exist in unbounded space. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much, Kebede. Me, I'm going to start with uh, the, some of the responses to the questions that uh, you posed. Uh, for example, uh, the issues of uh, uh, cultural and artistic diversities in the 55 countries I would say we start by contextualizing, but like we said from the 
opening statement is that uh, if, for example, from the other themes that we have, heritage and economic cooperation, intergovernmental cooperation, exchange programs of uh, cultural exchanges, which can be organized by our governments, small, small, we can go by now appreciating each other's culture, uh, arts and heritage, and also now come by Helen. to now appreciate. And that is a, a very uh, good starting point. But the problem is that um, the building of silos instead of bridges is our problem. But I don't think contextualizing and uh, maybe starting to make sure within our own context, we have done very well. That's important. Then about artists, I realized that artists are not given high value in their own countries, particularly in Africa. But when they go abroad, their work is very much recognized. And, uh, and that is something which is uh, good to say. Uh, so he talked about uh, mainly unbounded space of art and democracy. And for real, yes, uh, that comes by as we see our artists, see. And see. musicians and dancers are going by in Bye -bye. other countries. Thank you very much. Uh, now, I just want to announce once again that uh, we also have uh, Mozambique and uh, Tanzania on board. I'm not sure if uh, I had announced uh, those uh, uh, countries. Uh, and uh, from there, please, uh, let's now move on to uh, heritage and economic cooperation. Uh, Pamela, over to you. I don't know who muted me. Over to you, Pamela. Can you uh, call upon uh, Dr. Pamela Dako uh, to talk to us about heritage and economic cooperation uh, all the way uh, from Ghana? And then we also move to uh, Dr. Bright Lumo Mensa with intergovernmental cooperation, and we are going to remain in Ghana. Thank you. After that, we quickly now go to uh, the chat panel and check what our participants are saying. Um, Dr. Dako, I hope uh, your connection is good. Yeah, I'm here. Can, can you hear me now? Uh, now wait until Pamela introduces you. You wait briefly. Pamela, over to you. Thank you, Doc. So Dr. Kwabna Daku Ekwamwa is a cultural anthropologist with a PhD in African Studies, MPhil in Archaeology, and a Bachelor of Arts in Geography and Resource Development. He is a lecturer with the multidisciplinary studies of the whole Technical University, Ghana. His research interests are on African cultures and development, <clears throat> Africa indigenous knowledge, and Africa environmental issues. Dr. Ekwamwa, your audience, kindly have the floor. Thank you very much, Pamela, and thank you very much, Dr. Makoku, for having me. Thank you, my fellow panelists. It has been very insightful listening to you. Everybody has contributed immensely, so it makes me more like I'm, I'm going to um, summarize what I'm going to say because uh, I had to change my PC from one to another, so I'm not going to put any PowerPoint, but I'm going to speak to points. I want to ask a very simple question. Can the imaginary eraser clean the indelible boundaries? Once again, I ask, can the in imaginary eraser clean the indelible borderlines of Africa? We all know that between the period of uh, um, um, 18, 1844 and 1845, um, our European counterparts sat down and divided us into and imaginary countries that we, we call ourselves now. And, and, and a conference that had an effect on, on, on the African continent. There is an ambiguous relation, relation between the Berlin Conference and the inter-trading activities among most African states. In terms of pre-colonial trading activities and current trading patterns, the Berlin Conference had significantly impacted 
a majority, majority of us into ethnic groups or into national groups, which is becoming a major problem. There is a large body of public scholarship indicating that one of the primary reasons for African colonization was economic. So they came here to do economic with us, but we are not doing economics within our, our, ourselves. Africa has always been required for the commodities it can supply directly to Europe, most notably gold, uranium, iron, all, all those things. I, I, I was looking through all those uh, um, minerals we have here in Africa. We almost have everything from land space to manganese, uranium, diamond, and listening to Professor PLO Lumumba, he said, we have almost everything, but we don't produce anything. Like I said from uh, Cameroon, they have chocolate, but they don't have a chocolate re refinery center. We have gold, we don't have gold refinery center. I, I go, I, I, so one of the most contentious issues in recent years has been whether Africa can survive without international trade and rather concentrate on trade among member states. This in recent year have given me, have given, have given rise to what has come to be referred to as the African Continental Free Trade Area, AFCTFTA, which is which the headquarters is in Ghana, and it was it was erected in January. This came into force in January. It will have a, it will have a combined market of 1.2 million people, 1.2 million across 55 states. If all member states come on board, it will also ensure that the continent benefits from the increased trade as a block. We now will not go as individual countries, but we will go as a block and in numbers there is power, we all know. So based on that on, on that act, the third pillar of the, uh, the um, AFCTFT, which is leveraging extractive for transformation, whose main goal is to assist countries in using their natural resources. This is where I bring my heritage issue in. Almost all our natural resources have been heritage to us and inherited, we have both tangible and intangible. So all these minerals are in our soil. So we, we, there's an act, the third one that tries to look at that. To more effectively support economic transformation by optimizing revenue taken from projects, managing in the transparent and accountable manner, linking to other economic sectors and increasing local content and employment. When effectively implemented, the pillar will help to maintain the economic value of African heritage. I have no doubt that inter-African country is the best thing to do. Currently, the intra-African trade is very low. It's estimated at 16% compared to the intra-European trade, which is over 60%. President Aramoy, one of my favorite presidents, in, could not have been more, more correct when he stated that there are many challenges posed by globalization. During the signing of the treaty that brought the common market for East Africa and Southern African countries, the Comasa in Kenya, we should recognize that it is, in, it is past time to reset our priorities and serve our people. We must reduce poverty, increase regional trade. As the whole world moves towards a more humanistic era, Africa has been compelled to move with the rest of the world in terms of trade and politics. But this has not helped Africa. The partnership that we've ever all gone through are like a master servant partnership, which I think we should, if we go into an intra partnership amongst ourselves, we, we are going to do well. In the end, this is my opinion. Globalization partnership will not benefit Africa that much. The majority of African scholars argue that the negative aspect of globalization far outweigh the positives for Africa. Ali Mazuri, one of my one of the people I see as mentors in African studies, in his views of Africa, as stated in his 1980 seminary work entitled "The African Condition: A Political Prognosis," he says, "Africa." is the first habitat of man, but it is the last to be habitable. Africa are not the most brutalized of all. 
people, but probably the most humiliated in modern history. African societies are the closest to the West, the West culturally, but have been experiencing the most rapid pace of westernization. Africa is not the poorest of all the regions of the world in the resources, but it is the least developed of the uninhabited continent. Africa is not the smallest of the continent, but it is probably the most fragmented and Africa is the most central of all continents in geographical location, but politically and to some extent military, it may be the most marginal. Based on this, and with time, I want to, re I want to recommend the following in all member, member countries for a meaningful heritage and economic cooperation in Africa. The reverse of what has become to known the resource case. And, and I know most of us have, have read about the resource case. You have the resources, but the resource is not blessing you. It is rather cursing you. Because revenues from minerals and natural resources should, should provide funds for badly needed development are being pocketed in, 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 in wrong pockets. A recent World Bank report concludes that the discovery of oil and mineral resources does little to improve prospects for poor people. And in most instances, the lot may even worsen. It is unfortunate that countries with considerable mineral wealth, heritage, are theaters of conflict. Notable among them, I don't want to mention, I am praying that it will turn around for the better. But we remember Sierra Leone, we remember Congo, we remember all those places. These countries were supposed to have been among the developed countries by now, but instead of this, instead of these countries are synonymous with greed, state corruption, conflicts, environmental degradation, poverty, and violence. Another important step to fulfill the, 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 um, the African free trade agenda is to promote and nature, art, and culture activities. The formation of art and cultural societies over the border, over the imaginary bodies, the historical and geographical groups should be formed to encourage intra-traveling. The bodies must come down. The barriers must come down, particularly among students in schools and colleges. If, if the generation before, before the colleges and universities do not get that, I think the schools and the colleges should get that now. I normally cherry, I normally admire the, the, the fr Francophone countries when they travel into the Anglophone countries, but the Anglophone countries don't normally travel into the uh, Francophone countries. I think we should encourage that as well. Again, culture's various components, particularly the system of symbolic and material products, as well as aspects of the action systems, such as festivals, naming and outdooring ceremonies, marriages, burials, and funerals should be probably documented and made available in schools and libraries and tourist centers. And when it's made available, we realize that we all follow a similar pattern. Naming ceremony in Africa follow the same pattern. Funerals all normally follow the same patterns. And that will be able to join us together to, to know that we are of a people, of one stock, and it was only an imaginary line that broke us apart. Thank you very much. And thank you for having me. Ah, uh, thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Yes, um, yes, I was uh, checking and asking more people which countries you are coming from. Uh, in case there are some we haven't given me, I just uh, pushed the, um, a few messages so that we can continue to have them down. Uh, thank you, Dr. Dako. Yes, uh, we have had you. We have everything, but we have nothing in Africa. Why African continent um, should have a trade block uh, that can be more powerful and we should increase intra-Africa trade, um, increase intra-Africa trade. I reiterate heritage issues involve the land, the minerals and uh, all that we have inherited, the culture, you know, culture is passed from one generation to another and so on. He asked a pertinent question, globalization, will it help us? Sometimes 
When we even talk in the higher and tertiary education of internationalization, you are saying that um, if we have internationalization, will we have uh, people in the West uh, also moving to institutions in the uh, East and South uh, to school there, the way uh, people from Africa go to other continents in the name of globalization and in the name of internationalization. It seems uh, the arrow points in one direction, or if not, the arrow is thin as it approaches Africa and gets thicker as it goes to other continents. I don't know, food for thought, Africans are the most humiliated and uh, most westernized. How does that impact on us? Is it uh, somewhere, is it uh, because uh, of our history or the westernization? How are we taking it? Are we also taking everything to our own advantage? Uh, that is also food for thought, resource case. Yes, you have the resources, they are being exploited, but what are you getting? You know, even where uh, a bamboo is being shipped out to make toothpicks elsewhere and the toothpicks are brought back, uh, those communities are poor communities. Why? Why can't we make our own toothpicks here using uh, our own bamboo, which is a resource that is here, which now something we don't see the value of the resource what is it? What is cooking in that uh, pot of uh, questions and uncertainties? Uh, I liked the last uh, point, ceremonies to be documented and followed by all. Yes, I think uh, documentation is one way to bring about harmonization. But I also want to say about uh, the ceremonies. Do you know, uh, Dr. Dako, that you are talking of the naming ceremony. In other countries, they don't even have the naming ceremony. And so those are some of the disparities which we would want to look into. Having said that, um, allow me to move to Dr. Um, Bright Lumo Mensa. Again, we are hovering here around Ghana. Uh, and we are saying to Dr. Bright Lumo Mensa, what do you have to offer us? Let Pamela introduce you and you come on board. He is our last speaker before we now go on to the question and answer session and also any comments which may be uh, uh, coming from all of us. Over to you, Pamela. And Pamela, once you introduce the Dr. Bright Lumo Mensa, make sure you are now consolidating the questions and the comments. Let's start particularly with the questions and then we, uh, you are going to direct them to the concerned people after Dr. Bright Lumo Mensa. Go ahead, thank you. We are doing well, very, very well in terms of time. Thank you. Dr. Bright Lumo Mensa is an African studies lecturer at the host of Nepal University in Ghana. His main areas of expertise include African policies and security, international relations and diplomacy, and Africa in the global context. You are welcome, Dr. Bright. Please have the floor. Thank you very, very much, uh, Pamela. And thank you for giving me this a uh, very important opportunity. And I really consider it to be a huge privilege to also contribute to this uh, all important African discussion. Uh, I have listened to a lot of interesting discussion and I think that uh, it's all so nice that Africans can come together and, ha and have discussions about the continent and how the continent can progress together in all aspects, culturally, politically, economically and in, in, in every other way. So today I would be talking on the need for intergovernmental 